nice little work. Okay, so if this is our SMART goal, how, what are, let's just brainstorm a few ways we could maybe measure that. Take pictures, that's a good one. So kind of before and after. Uh, maybe once per week. So kind of that before and after deal, or before, during, after. What are some other ways you could maybe measure this? Especially if you had like red itchy patches, taking a picture of that specifically would be helpful. And then we do that in wound care sometimes as nurses. Um, you can. Uh, take pictures when you, the wound first starts, and then it doesn't matter how many people are changing a dressing, you can refer back to, okay, is it worse or better than it was? So if you've never seen it before, you have that guide to go by. So pictures are good. There's some other things maybe we could, it's just brainstorming, because whatever we come up with maybe is something you guys can use in yours, right? So making your own scale. scale to track level of itchiness. So I always think it's, if there's already a tool that's been developed and used um, by other people, like in the medical field or whatever, that might be nice because it's been proven to work. But you can definitely, if it doesn't exist, create your own tool to track it too. If it doesn't look at what exactly you want. So you can make your own. So it sounds like a lot of you are maybe doing that. You're doing uh, making your own kind of scale to check in. Are there any other things you think you could do here for tracking this goal? What are some things you might not want to do? What are some things that might interfere with your goal? Yeah. So no extra moisturizers, because that's going to um, make your results funny, right? If every second day you're using a moisturizer, then that might um, interfere with what your baths are. If you've always been using that same moisturizer all the time, and you still have dry skin, then you could add that in. Just keep it the same. Don't add anything new at the same time that might uh, um, interfere with whether or not it's actually... No. Oh. <laughs> moisturizer. <laughs> that you don't always use. Any other ideas for tracking that? Dry skin and hands and face? Yeah. Keep showering consistent. It's kind of nice if it's, it's like a six week thing, right? Then you, it's not spanning seasons, so that's kind of nice because naturally our skin's um, a little drier in the winter around here anyway. So those are good ideas. That would be a good way to track those things. So what about this one? So I'll, I will improve my score in a simple recall memory test by 20% over the next six weeks through once daily consumption of 10 raw almonds that have been prepared into a milk beverage. That's very specific. <laughs> so what are some ways you could track that? So when you're making your data tracking, what, what are some ways you think? Yeah, this one's very specific in that you're probably going to be doing that simple recall memory test. 
So you can do some research about something like this. These memory tests exist. Simple recall memory test. So how often might you do it? If you're doing your six-week goal, once a week maybe? What's something you'd have to keep in mind here? If you're doing a test once a week to see if you improve over by 20%, what's something you would not want to do? You wouldn't want to do the same test every week, right? Because you're obviously going to improve, <laughs> probably, right? So it would have to be different tests, but similar. So not like harder or whatever. So different questions. Because if you take it six times, by the time you're doing it the sixth time, you're going to remember what the questions were and you're going to naturally get better, right? Same as if you test regularly for, or if you study regularly for a test, you're going to naturally remember more. So you're going to want different questions on each test, right? Is there another way you could track your data here? So that's the obvious one for this one. What's something else you could do? Too early in the morning to brainstorm, eh? <laughs> so you could even, if you wanted, if, so if you're doing like this course over that six weeks, you're going to probably do at least tests, two tests. You could even compare tests in school if you wanted. Just as extra data, obviously you're going to have to have that one for this SMART goal, but you might extra data that you're putting in. So if you're um, creating some kind of log, so that's something. So some ideas I had here, so the questionnaire, so a lot of you are doing that anyway. And I get, there's an example of one there that I found just as an example. Let me see here. I'll just show you what it looks like. Whoops. So here's an example. So this is a, a standardized mood and feelings questionnaire. So if whatever, if your goal had to do with uh, your mood or feelings, um, this could be a questionnaire that you would use for that. And I just found it online. So if you were improving your mood by whatever it means, like, I don't know, some kind of food item or something you're going to eat every day, whatever your goal was. You could once a day or once every two days take something like this. So it's kind of keeping a log. So you would put the date and you'd say, so I felt miserable or unhappy. Not true, sometimes true. So that's just an example of a neat little questionnaire that could be part of your tracking, right? Other things I put in, observing and recording, so a log would be kind of cool. So if it was your goal had to do with energy and how you're tired, keep a log. So every day just write a couple sentences like, I really felt like I needed a nap today. I drank four extra cups of coffee to try to stay awake. Um, I fell asleep 15 minutes after I got home from school while watching Grey's Anatomy, like whatever. You could keep a log every day of that stuff. Then at the end, go back and kind of assess it more as, uh, so that would be like qualitative data. So it's not something you're actually measuring, but you can go back and see if there's an improvement over the six weeks. So a log. Um, so also observing and recording. So like in the other one you guys said about pictures, like if you were talking about dry skin or itchy rash or whatever, then uh, pictures could be helpful. So before, during, and after pictures. 
but they have to be appropriate, right? I don't want, <laughs> you know, I don't, for like, if your goal, I, I don't really want pictures necessarily. Uh, maybe an artist's conception or drawing or something would be okay, but, uh, um, okay. So that's just, so that data collecting is due the 24th. Is that Tuesday, right? Am I right? So the, however you are going to, yeah, the 24th. So however you're going to track your data for your research project, so come up with how you're going to do that. That's due on the 24th. So there's another Dropbox if you want to put it there. So under, uh, in D2L, under um, the side menu, there's the body systems goal. When you click on that, it brings up the different sections. So the data one's actually in with the goal, but you can put another document in there. So, but you can also email it or whatever. I'd like for it to all be in one spot, but I'm not going to say, well, if you can't do that, you fail. No, I'm not, I won't do that. It's okay. I'll, I'll accept whatever way you want to give it to me. What? Cynthia? No. Oh. <laughs> I don't get the inside joke, I guess. Okay, so we are going to do the, just the anatomy and physiology piece of human digestion. So I kind of like this topic, but maybe you guys won't, I don't know. So we ended Tuesday, what, this is Friday yet, we ended Tuesday where we're talking about how some organisms have the one way in and the one way out for the, their digestion. Mostly small organisms um, have it like that. Thankfully we don't, we have the canal. So the alimentary canal, so that's a, an important term to maybe remember that we have, you know, one way where things go in and then things come out another exit. So we do not have everything happening out of one hole, which is very lucky for us. So the canal part of it, and then we have accessory organs. So there are some things connected to our canal that also produce things that help with digestion. So we'll go through that stuff too. So there's salivary glands are one, pancreas, liver, and gallbladder. So those are kind of the, um, the accessory organs that attach and help with uh, our digestion. Um, okay, we'll talk about those in a bit. And just that our canal is uh, divided into specialized organs. So ours is actually kind of complicated compared to some animals. But um, So this is just the overview. So on this side, so this will look familiar from your worksheet that you're doing. So it divides this up into your accessory organs. So it shows your salivary glands up here around the mouth. So basically those are the spots that are making your spit. Um, your liver here, your gallbladder being attached to your liver, your pancreas is this yellow bit tucked under your stomach, but we're going to go over these separately, so don't worry about this is not all you're getting. And then as far as our elementary canal, so it starts with our mouth, and our tongue is part of that, uh, that area, our pharynx, our pharynx, so that's the, just the piece that's connecting our mouth to our esophagus, stomach, intestine, large intestine, all the way down to your anus. So we're going to go over these. We'll do that. We'll get down to there, okay? It's basically a storage area sometimes, yeah. Has anyone had their gallbladder out? Nobody? Everybody has their gallbladder? That's awesome. <laughs> yeah? Was it after they had kids? No. No? No, some, oftentimes that, for some reason, uh, no, so, for some reason, sometimes after, like just shortly after you have kids, sometimes people end up with gallbladder issues after that, but, so I was just curious, what? Um, it starts as that, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so the mouth being the first part that you're putting the food in. So if we're eating our pizza, we're putting it there first. Um, so mouth or oral cavity. Um, so that's where everything starts. So on Tuesday, we separated things into mechanical 
and chemical digestion. So the first piece in your mouth is going to be mechanical. So what are we doing in our mouths? Obviously with food. Chewing, right? Um, so our teeth are cutting it, grinding it, making it smaller so that it's easier for the chemical digestion to work later on. But chemical digestion starts in our mouths too. So our spit that's coming from our salivary glands is the very first step to some chemical digestion. And that's actually for carbohydrates. Uh, let me see here. Let me write something for you. And hopefully this doesn't try to implode on me today. So di chemical digestion starts, where did I just say? <laughs> Yep. So I'll just try to put some important points here. So chemical di digestion starts in your mouth. With your saliva. So in your mouth, the saliva is going to start with your carbohydrates. So the macromolecule, so the digestion of your carbohydrates is what's starting in your mouth. Okay. And does anyone remember what carbohydrate breaks down into from Tuesday? Sugars. So they say, and I was going to bring you guys a cracker to try this, but I tested on my husband. He's like, I don't know. So if you eat a cracker or a piece of bread and hold it in your mouth, the longer you hold it there and have your spit with it, um, it's supposed to taste more sweet. So um, because, yeah, you're so lot. So try that at some point um, because you're your saliva is starting to break down those carbohydrates to make sugar. So it's supposed to be, taste more sweet the longer you hold it there. Okay. All right. So the mouth, and that's where we're starting. Mechanical and chemical digestion both start in that spot. So here's just a diagram of what's going on your, in your mouth. So in the first unit, we started talking about, so... Over time, we've evolved to have different types of teeth in our mouth. The front ones are used for what? What? Tearing, biting. Yep, they're a little sharper and smaller. Our back teeth, this guy has all his teeth, even has his wisdom teeth. So our back teeth are good for what? Grinding, yeah, making things a lot smaller. So this shows a couple of openings for your salivary glands. Have you ever opened your mouth and had like spit shoot? Oh, you should demonstrate for, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so that's where it's coming from. So uh, um, these openings for our salivary glands, so our salivary glands are located like around our mouth and in the, our neck and the openings are in your mouth and that's when that can happen. You can have some shoot out while you're, are you demonstrating? Over? No. <laughs> um, so your, our tongue, so our tongue's an important piece of that too. What do you think our tongue, how's that involved with eating? Yeah, it helps move the food around in our mouth. Yeah. It puts it into a manageable chunk to swallow later. What's another reason we use our tongues when we're eating? Well, you shouldn't talk while you're eating, but uh, taste, that's one. So humans have a pretty evolved sense of taste. Why do you think that's important? Why do you think over time that has become a benefit for humans to have evolved taste? Mm -hmm. I like craft dinner. Yeah, rotten. So we are better able to detect if something might be rotten, definitely. Yeah, or mold. We can taste that things taste bad. Also, there are certain uh, things 
that you'd find in nature, like berries and things that are poison. And often those will taste bad. They'll taste really bitter or awful. And if we didn't have a good sense of taste, we might just keep eating it. So our, over time, humans have developed it as a benefit to have that uh, keen sense of taste. So we don't eat rotten things and poison things generally. So tongue, you guys are absolutely right. So we're tasting. It shapes our food after we've chewed it into a ball that's easier for us to swallow. And then it also brings it to the back of our throat before we swallow it. So the pharynx, or pharynx, however you want to say it, um, that's just the piece, kind of so, if you're thinking about the back of your throat, so it's going to be the piece that's connecting our mouth to our esophagus. So the esophagus is the tube that finishes going to your stomach. So it's just basically the back of the throat. And it's also kind of like a, a junction, too, because in humans, that's also where our trachea meets. So that's the tube to our lungs. So we have the tube to our lungs and to our stomach kind of all opening up in the same area. And that area is the pharynx. Okay. So when you think of things going down the wrong way, what can you imagine is probably happening there? So if you're eating something and all of a sudden you're coughing and hacking and your face is red and... Yeah, it's kind of, uh, it got redirected a bit and it's irritating that opening to your lung. Yeah. So if you put your hand on your, over your throat, and it's easier to feel in men because um, they have a larger uh, area around their voice box here, but you can still feel it. So put your hand over your throat and swallow. What do you feel happening? What's happening? Like, just describe what you feel. Hmm? It moves. Yeah. So there is a little door almost right here in the pharynx, and it's called the epiglottis. So that's basically a flap that protects your airway when you're swallowing. So when you swallow, your so the um, esophagus moves up some. And because it moves up, your epiglottis flops down over top of it. Yeah, you can feel it's a reflex that happens when you swallow. So when you swallow, you can feel it moving up. And it's easier on a man sometimes because there's more of uh, the Adam's apple there. So you can feel it a little easier, but um, we can still feel it too. So essentially what's happening is this is moving up some, which is closing this flap down to try to protect whatever we're swallowing from going into our lungs and trachea. So, so just think of the pharynx as this kind of crossroad where go to our lungs and our stomach. So if something goes down the wrong way, what goes wrong is maybe you swallowed really fast, that reflex didn't have a chance to fully close this, or sometimes it might have been stuck a little bit open, or um, some people end up having, especially like later in life, you can have some swallowing problems, so you don't have that strong kind of reflex happening. Um, Alzheimer's and dementia is often have, or, yeah, and nerve, too, like uh, um, the muscles surrounding it can be weaker. Yeah. So when something goes down the wrong way, just a tiny piece of whatever you're swallowing, and it can be very tiny, gets into this area instead and irritates it, and your body's defense mechanism against that is coughing and coughing and coughing to clear it out of there where it's not supposed to be. Okay. So after the pharynx, we're going into the esophagus. So that's the tube running to your stomach. And Rachel noted, or she mentioned peristalsis. So that's where this is starting. 
So the smooth muscle tissue, so you don't have to think about it, but all the way through the rest of our digestive tract, you're having contractions and relaxing of your muscles so that it's moving the food along. So that's exactly what, I think there's a picture here. So that's exactly what's happening starting here in your esophagus. So the muscles contract, and when they relax, then they contract again, relax, and that squeezes whatever you swallowed down into your stomach. And as we go along, you're going to have these sphincters, they're called. So basically, these are at different parts along the digestive tract to keep things from going in the wrong direction. So whatever the way they're not supposed to go, right? <clears throat> so they're just muscles on either side of the canal that are going to close that off after things go through it. Throwing up, yeah, so that's going to be the reverse of it. So throwing up, what, for whatever reason, your body's decided what's in there needs to come out, and those will relax to let, to let that come out. Yeah, like when a snake eats something, it is using the same kind of contractive forces to move stuff along. Yep. Okay, so after you're going through the esophagus, you've made your way into the stomach. So it's kind of has a few different functions. So it's a storage tank, kind of. It's uh, um, crumpled up, and then when you eat, it has folds in it that will expand to hold whatever it is that you ate, whether it's the big turkey dinner or whatever. Um, so there's a few different things you're going to find in there. So and in general, it's going to be called gastric juice. So hydrochloric acid is a big part of it. So that acid is helping to chemically break up food and break it down. Um, and then you have some digestive enzymes. Most importantly, that's where you're getting your pepsin. Does anyone remember what pepsin breaks down? P? It starts with a P. Protein. So that's one way of remembering pepsin is that's where your protein. <clears throat> um, so once you're in the stomach, you have protein. And does anyone remember what protein's getting broken down into that we can absorb? Mm. Amino acids, yep. So amino acids are what our body is able to use to make new proteins for us. Whoops, I spelled it wrong here. And so that's starting in the stomach. So carbohydrate digestion started where? In the mouth. It continues on through, so it's, it's not all done in the mouth, but it started in the mouth. And protein digestion started in the stomach. Anyone need that for a second longer? Okay. So digestive enzymes, hydrochloric acid, and the last thing is mucus. So if you guys watched that YouTube video, it did tell you. So what do you think the function of mucus is? Yeah, it's protective. Yep, it's protective. So this, uh, the folds in the stomach, it describes as being accordion-like almost. So uh, actually called rugae. And so your stomach can be pretty small, but then it can be fold out to be a lot larger when you eat something. So there's another one of those sphincters, those muscles that will uh, clench together to hold stuff in the stomach once it goes through. This is just showing your food. So your stomach, if you listen to it, or sometimes you don't need a stethoscope, you can hear your stomach growling. What is happening when you're hearing that? Or not even growling, even if you've just eaten and you hear your stomach make gurgles and noise. 
What is our stomachs doing? Anyone? Any idea? It's digesting food. It's moving. So it, your stomach is moving. So it's another spot where some mechanical digestion is happening too. So it kind of crunches and kind of uh, breaks that food up a little bit more mechanically. So not only is it doing chemical digestion with the enzymes, it's also squishing it up a little bit more. So there are two places there that mechanical digestion happen, the mouth and the stomach. Okay. After the stomach, it's going to head along into the small intestine. At the bottom of the stomach, you have another one of those sphincters that are going to prevent things from coming back up. You guys have any questions so far? No? Um, so chyme, that's what it's called when you swallow your food, it gets into your stomach and it's mixed with that hydrochloric acid and your digestive enzymes, it's called chyme. Okay. So you're, you're familiar with this if you've ever thrown up or even sometimes like when you have a bad stomach bug and you have diarrhea, that's going to be basically what's coming out. That's how fast it goes through your system if you're ill. Your body's like, nope, we're getting rid of this. Goodbye. We're not going to worry about absorbing anything or water or any of that stuff. It's just going. Um, so you already said this. Mucus is uh, it's a protective factor, really, for our stomach to protect it from the acid and the enzymes. Essentially, if we didn't have any kind of protective mechanisms, our stomachs would just digest itself. Uh, so it's also um, that epithelial that epithelial tissue that we talked about and how quickly it uh, has turnover. So we talked about our skin cells replicating so fast that even a day after we die, there's still takes them a day to think, oh yeah, I should stop doing that because they're going so fast. Same with our stomachs. So the inside of our stomachs, every three days pretty much has a new cell lining. That's how fast they shed off and develop new um, cells. Um, Oh, and generally, another protective mechanism is the fact that we're usually making most of these enzymes when we're actually eating. So if we're not eating, we're not generally making as much of it. So it's not just our empty stomach full, filled with the enzymes and acid. So usually there's uh, food there that it's actually working on. What does it hurt? Well, there is still some there. So it's not, it doesn't completely shut down production, but it could be, so if you go past your hunger cue, some people do feel that as pain. Yeah. I'm not sure if it hurts like that. Yeah, I guess it's just not, it could also be like muscle, if you don't have enough or low blood sugar or uh, your electrolytes are off, even your muscles can contract and cause pain too. So it could be more to do with being devoid of those. Yeah, but if you have things like, and we'll go over this kind of a little more briefly next week at some point, but stomach ulcers too. So there are different things you can have going on that cause pain or reflux. Does anybody have bad heartburn or reflux? You get reflux. Yeah. 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 So those can cause pain too. Like if you have, and it's basically this uh, sphincter here starts letting things come up. That's basically what heartburn is. So it fails in some way or you know, some people have more issues, but it fails in some way and that acid can come up to irritate your esophagus. That's what heartburn is, but same, only more of a chronic thing. You can just say, oh, I have heartburn without having like a, you know, reflux. It just means that that's happening over again enough that it's potentially damaging up here. 
everyone can have heartburn every now and then, but not necessarily be like named GERD is what it's called anyway. So chyme, that's an important term. That's what all that mixture in our stomach's called. Um, oh, look there, we were going to talk about that anyway. So that's just the backflow, um, heartburn caused by backflow of chyme into the esophagus. And then gastric ulcers are just erosions in your stomach lining. So for whatever reason, your stomach, um, they used to think more stress would cause it, but now they're leaning more to our, well, there are a lot of research is going towards it being a bacteria that's causing it now. So um, it's just a uh, part of your stomach lining is eroded away some, so it's exposed more and can cause pain. Medications can too, yep. Yeah. Especially like um, non, yeah, anti-inflammatories like uh, aspirin or naproxen, yep. Yeah. Oh, and you take it often? Yeah, it can be really hard on your stomach. Yeah. Yeah. For your reflux. Oh, and the pain. But did the pink lady work? It's usually pretty immediate, eh? <laughs> it has lidocaine in it, so it completely numbs. It also gets rid of stomach acid, so part of the medication in it tampers down your stomach acid, but it also has lidocaine, so it numbs it at the same time, too. Yeah, that's not something you want to take home. No. If you take naproxen a lot, that's maybe where you want to start. Do something other than that, if that's irritating your stomach start there. Do you also take a stomach pill? Yeah. Uh, so this was just a little piece in your in your textbook. So it's kind of interesting to know what gastric bypass is because you'll hear about it in the media all the time. So essentially what it's doing is stapling off this part of your stomach. So what you're left with is up here. So when you're eating a meal, all you're filling is this area up here. So this is a weight loss surgery. So you're not able to eat as much. You have to eat smaller, more frequent meals. So it is a little bit, isn't it? So you're not, you're really not using all of this part of your stomach. And then they reconnect your small intestine up to this tiny piece here. So they still do have to reconnect this part down here because your stomach's still going to make acid, right? So it still has to find its way out. But that's essentially, it's just kind of interesting. So if you hear about having your stomach stapled for weight loss surgery, that's what they're doing. No, a tummy tuck is your skin on the outside. Yeah. Um, this is getting your stomach stapled, so they will sometimes say. There's another, like a newer procedure is basically almost twist tying it off instead of stapling. Yeah. So that's like a, what is it called? Uh, a band of some kind. It has like a, it's basically putting a band around instead of stapling. That's what it's doing. So it's kind of cool. So after the stomach, it goes through that bottom sphincter at the bottom of the stomach into the small intestine. So this is where a lot of important stuff happens, obviously. It's where almost all of the absorption of the nutrients are happening. And it's very long. So most of us are, it would be around 25, 30 feet long or small intestine. Um, but it's not very big around, so only you know, inch, inch and a half or so around, but very long. And so it's the major spot where a lot of uh, chemical digestion happens, but most important, that's where a lot of the absorption of our nutrients. Okay. Um, so the first piece of the small intestine after the stomach, that's where a lot of stuff happens. So you're getting a lot more of uh, or a lot more of the digestive enzymes, and that's where your pancreas, liver, liver and gallbladder come into play. Those 
things are emptying their digestive enzymes into that part of the intestine. It's called the uh, duodenum. Okay, so that's the first part of the intestine. So that's an important term if you want to make note of that one. <laughs> duodenum, hint, hint, yes. So that first part, that's the first part, just the name of the first part of your small intestine, okay? About a foot, so it's about a foot in, okay? So this is kind of what it looks like. So we have our stomach, that chyme that's all mixed up here coming into this first part of our small intestine. So that's where you have your pancreas connected here, your liver's connected, and your gallbladder. Alrighty. Yeah. So the main thing our liver's producing is bile. Our gallbladder acts as like a storage area for bile. So even if someone has had their gallbladder removed, they're still getting the bile. It just doesn't have the storage location for it. So if you have your gallbladder, you're digesting your food, your gallbladder will squeeze what it's storing out into the intestine. So bile is actually what's going to break down the fats. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. No, that's okay. Well, that's bile there. Yeah, so it kind of... It's needed to break down fat. Yeah. Yeah, but it's not something we're going to absorb into our bodies now. So we're going to talk... We'll go over that a little bit. Usually we are not actually throwing up bile. It, um, and that's because of that sphincter at the bottom of our stomach. So generally, we're not, bile is not getting up into our stomachs. So it's usually stomach acid that you're throwing, and the mucus in your stomach, and the hydrochloric acid, you know, so. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. But you do hear that a lot, like throwing up bile. If that lower sphincter lets some in, and that's possible because when you're throwing up, there's a lot of muscles happening there. So it's possible that you'd have some, but okay. So your pancreas, so that's a large gland. And it's kind of located, it's going to go through this guy here. So I'll show you, I'll show you after with this one. Um, so kind of behind the stomach a bit. So if the stomach's here, your pancreas is kind of a little bit below behind your stomach where it would be. So the pain, so what the pancreas does is it puts its, it has a lot of enzymes in it too, but a main thing it does is neutralizing the stomach acid. So the acid is so corrosive, you need something to counteract that to bring it back down to not being so acidic, so it doesn't burn the rest of your digestive tract. So that's a main function of the pancreas, giving off the juice that's going to bring down that, uh, acidity level. And it also has lots of enzymes. So the pancreas is putting more enzymes in there that are going to further break down your carbohydrates, further break down um, your protein, and even some of your fats. So it's very important. It's not, but it's involved there, so we'll do that as far in the uh, hormone chapter. But insulin is involved there, yeah. But, yep, yep. So as far as our intestine and digestion goes, we'll just worry. We won't worry about insulin in this unit, but uh, it st stomach acid and it also has enzymes, and it gives it into that first part of the small intestine. Okay, so bile, so that's your pancreas, bringing down, or bringing down the acidity level, more enzymes. Your liver creates bile, so 
uh, bile is really what's breaking up the fat so that it can be uh, broken down further by enzymes. So bile is important for breaking it up into smaller bits of fat. <laughs> And the gallbladder comes into play just because it's a storage area for the bile that the liver makes. And all of it comes into the duodenum with, via a duct. Okay, so it's all connected there. So I can show you this guy here. We'll dismantle him just a little bit. Ugh. So up here, you can kind of see where the pharynx would be. You can come closer if you want, if you're interested. So up here in the throat. Okay. So let's take his lungs off. We'll do that next time. And we'll take his heart out too. Yes, very sad. So you can see the, uh, coming from up here, the pharynx. Your esophagus is coming down. We'll just remove his liver for a minute. So your esophagus is coming down, and this would be your stomach. Okay. So that's kind of a pretty good size to what you were what you're thinking for your stomach. So mouth, pharynx, um, esophagus, stomach. So your stomach is going into your small intestine. So that's this this guy here. Um, so I took his liver off. So the liver is connected to that first part of your small intestine. And I think here, this green bit under here would be your gallbladder. Your, your liver is creating your bile, storing it in your gallbladder, and squirting it into the first part of your intestine. Okay. And on this guy, your pancreas is this bubbly looking dude back here. So it's kind of hidden behind your stomach and liver, okay? What? Yeah, very weird. <laughs> so everything is uh, kind of packed in there pretty good. And just imagine when some when a woman's pregnant too, where does all this stuff go? Where does it all go? Who knows, what? Yeah, it gets all squished back or behind. and It hardly seems like there's room for a human in there, eh? Okay. So that small intestine, that is where a lot of our absorption comes from. So you guys remember the steps in digestion? What was the first step? There's four, remember? Ingestion's the first, and then we are doing what? Digesting. Digesting into what we can... Then do what? What was the third step? Absorbing. So absorbing those nutrients that we've broken down through digestion, that's what's going on in our small intestine. Elimination. Yep. So that going to the toilet. Do I have this turned on? Yes, I do. So your book gives a pretty neat, so as far as absorption goes, your book has a pretty neat analogy as far as a donut. So when you think of eating a turkey dinner, is that turkey dinner in your stomach inside your body or outside your body? You would think it's inside, but technically until our body absorbs nutrients, it's really outside because it's an open system. So if you think about a donut, so does it have the donut picture here? Is, that, is this person's finger inside or outside the donut? I don't know. We can debate that. It's not theology, but um, our elementary canal is pretty much the same in that things are not really inside our body until we've absorbed it. 
So it's kind of just a funny way of looking at it. Because it's an open system, there's openings in the top and the bottom. So until our cells get them, so that's the whole point really of digestion is our cells getting those nutrients from our food. So until our small intestine is absorbing it, it's really kind of still outside our body because it's inside the canal, right? So it's weird to wrap your head around a bit. Um, so just a little bit more about our, the inside of our small intestine. So in that, uh, in that YouTube video, it described the inside of our intestines kind of being like velvet. So it's kind of true in that um, the inside is covered with all kinds of these tiny projections that are called villi. And then on those villi are microvilli. So what it does is just making a huge surface area so that you have all kinds of places for absorption to happen. And just like, so if you remember with the nephron in the kidney, the blood vessels are what is reabsorbing back out of the filtrate. So same with our intestine, it's how our circulatory system has all of those tiny little blood vessels coming near all of those microvilli to absorb the nutrients that we're able to use. So it's just a picture. So this is kind of showing how the villi, villi are these like finger-like projections coming up into the center of the intestine. And then it even has on top there microvilli on top of the villi. So it just makes a huge surface area. And we have all of our blood vessels coming in to the villi to pick up those nutrients. So what, what is it we're able to absorb? So we can't absorb fats, but our body digests them into, does anybody remember? What does our body digest fats into that we're able to absorb? Fatty acids, yay. Whoops. So where did that digestion kind of start? Do you guys remember? The digestion of fatty acids? Or the digestion of fats? Or was that primarily happening? So our, our liver is making that, that bile that's breaking down fats into smaller fat droplets that then can be digested by enzymes coming from the pancreas or even the lining of the small intestine makes enzymes too. Is it there, guys? 9.30, yeah, we're doing pretty good. <clears throat> so why would our blood vessels need to pick up our nutrients? Yeah, that's how the rest of our body will get it. Something has to come by and pick them up from there, or the rest of our cells in our body aren't going to get those amino acids and fatty acids and uh, sugars. And this gives the muscle layer and shows uh, that smooth muscle that we talked about that's doing the peristalsis. So that peristalsis is continuing all the way through the rest here too, so the small intestine and then when we get to the large intestine. Just another picture showing the villi and microvilli. Lymphatic system, we'll talk about more later. I wouldn't worry too much about that. 
at the moment. So next is the large intestine. So after we go all the way through the small intestine, most of our nutrients have been absorbed by that point. Some, some little things might still happen in the large intestine. Um, so it's called large, but it's actually way shorter than the small intestine. It's only called large because it's wider. So the small intestine's got like 30 feet in here. The large intestine just runs kind of around the outside. It's a lot shorter, but it's like double or about double in size, or uh, width, I mean. Um, yeah, this guy down here, so has anyone had their appendix removed? We all have our gallbladders and our appendix, aren't we lucky? <laughs> So appendix, uh, even when I took biology in high school, it was like, well, that's just something that we don't need anymore. It used to be something way, way back in the day, but, um, but now it's just like a useless thing that sits there and waits to get infected, so you get appendicitis. But they're actually thinking now that when you're really, really sick, and your body, like if you have diarrhea or whatever, and your body's cleaning itself out, that your appendix is hanging on to all of your good bacteria because our guts really rely on bacteria to help um, break things down. It even gives us some nutrients, our bacteria. So they're thinking this uh, appendix um, holds on to some of that good bacteria. And then when we need it, it will recolonize our bowel with it. So that's uh, what they're thinking. So it'll be interesting to see how research goes as far as to look at people with and without an appendix and see if those without are sick more often or have more bowel conditions or whatever. And so, yeah, appendicitis is basically when the bad bacteria gets stuck in here and causes an infection. So it can swell and expand with um, infection. So that's appendicitis. Does anybody know anybody that's had appendicitis? Yeah, was it pretty bad or did they catch it early? Yeah, when she was young? Yeah. It, it was cancer there? Wow. Wow. Yeah. Has it spread other places? Yeah. Yeah. They tend to overlook young people having cancer. Sometimes they'll put them off a lot before they... Yeah. Wow. Wow. That's crazy. And so when they say about your appendix bursting, that means it's got so... In Did your sisters actually burst? Yeah. So it gets so inflamed and full of infection that it will actually burst and put that uh, material into your body so it can cause a lot of problems. So that's another little drawing there. Looks a little more realistic than this nub here, right here, I don't know. <laughs> um, but there's another sphincter there, so that's going to help prevent um, it from going back into the small intestine once it's in the large intestine. And so in our bodies, our, our large intestine does kind of wrap around just like it's showing that. And then it goes into the rectum and then the anus. So I think that's the next. <clears throat> so the main um, job for the large intestine is reabsorbing our water. So some nutrient absorption will happen there, but mainly is the main job is to put water back in our bodies. So when we have diarrhea, our colon is not doing its job of sucking that water back up. And so by removing water, it's, it's uh, creating stool or feces. So whatever's leftover waste that we didn't get any nutrients out of, could be leftover bacteria from our guts. Whatever is left over, the water gets sucked out of it, and what's left is feces. So that's just the undigested material that uh, was from our bodies. And interesting, like our 
I mentioned our guts being filled with bacteria and our bodies need it actually. Um, about a third of the dry weight of stool um, could be bacteria from our colon. So that's pretty significant considering how tiny bacteria is. A third of the weight of what we uh, excrete could be bacteria. Um, so some are even helpful like E. coli, which can make you really sick in the wrong instance. Actually, make it's always in our digestive systems and it makes B vitamins and vitamin K for our bodies. So it actually has a good, has a benefit to you. So natural gut flora. And something about taking antibiotics that kills off that good bacteria too. So it does make you more, when you take antibiotics, it does make you more susceptible later to maybe being sick too because it's killed off all of that good stuff that your body likes to use. I guess this doesn't, I guess this is supposed to be your rectum and your anus on this guy or girl. I guess they don't have uh, any reproductive structures, structures there, so it could be whatever we wanted it to be. Um, so especially in the very young or the very elderly, diarrhea um, can really cause a lot of problems. People can actually die because it can cause um, not enough nutrients to be absorbed and dehydration pretty quickly. So con on the other side of that, there's constipation that can happen. So generally in the large intestine, whether things are moving through too slowly, so if it moves slow, if our peristalsis is not moving it along quick enough, it just keeps sucking more water out. So the stool or feces will get drier and drier and harder to pass. So that's one reason um, why constipation could happen. Another could be not enough exercise. So if you're really um, low level of activity, um, that can make things not move along as quickly. And not having enough fiber. So you've probably heard about getting enough fiber in your diet. We kind of looked at where that fell under carbohydrates on the nutrition label yesterday. So getting fiber adds more bulk to your stool. So generally, it doesn't, it's a little difficult to wrap your head around, but tiny dry stool is actually harder to pass than like a bulkier stool, so constipation. Um, so this is just going over or disorders that can happen. So you've probably heard of things like celiac disease. Is that why gluten-free? Is that why you have celiac happening? Yeah. Um, so it's really, so a protein that's in wheat causes your body to react to it in kind of an inappropriate way and can make inflammation um, in your bowel. So really it makes the lining swell up and you're not absorbing nutrients how you should. So if people have uh, celiac disease, they have to be on very low gluten or no gluten diet. And another example is Crohn's disease. So that's another inflammation where the lining is swelling up and um, it causes a lot of problems as far as digestion goes. You're not going to absorb as much nutrients um, into your body. And a lot of pain can happen too, for sure. So the last six inches, so I guess this would be this guy's rectum here. So it's basically like another storage area. So that's where your stool is going to wait. There's a sphincter at the top. So that one's involuntary. So your stool will go into your rectum whether you want to or not. But the one on the outside is generally voluntary. Most of us can usually hold, hold it till we get to a bathroom or whatever. So thankfully that outside one is a little bit voluntary. Um, so it will relax when you want it to generally. So this is just kind of just a simplified version of the canal itself. So sometimes it helps to think about it in a more simple way. So here's our pizza starting here, going into our mouth. What was this piece called here that connected our mouth with our esophagus? Pharynx or pharynx? How do I spell that, guys? Is that right? I think so. 
<laughs> oh yeah, fair Nyx, right, there we go. Whatever, there we go. So after our, our fair Nyx, that's going into our, it actually doesn't label it here, but what's this piece? Our esophagus. Maybe if I keep Esophagus is going into our stomach. Our stomach leads into our small intestine, our large intestine, and then our rectum. And our anus. It might uh, keep going there anyway. So mechanical digestion, where did we say that was? The mouth and the stomach, right? So that lists it right here. So mouth and stomach, that's where the mechanical, so the actual physical turning and grinding or chewing of food. So the physical part of breaking down our food happens there. And then the chemical digestion. So it starts in our mouth. So what starts to be, di so we already talked about this. What starts to be digested in our mouth? Carbohydrates start in our mouth, so this is just review, is what we just talked about. Um, so that's where chemical digestion starts, the saliva from our salivary glands. So then chemical digestion continues in the stomach. So pepsin is in the stomach, and what does pepsin break down? Protein, both start with P, so that's a good way to remember, pepsin um, digests proteins. And then we also have enzymes in our small intestine. So where were those enzymes coming from? So that's the name of the first part of our small intestine, yes. first part of the small intestine is the duodenum. And actually, the lining of that does make some of these enzymes, you're right. But then there are two other structures that give more enzymes. What were those? Our liver, yeah. So our liver was one. And our, what was this guy? Our pancreas, yep. So, as far so we have the ingestion, the digestion, absorption. So, where did I say most of the absorption happens? Our small intestine. That's where most of the absorption happens. Some of it in the large intestine. There is some things there, like I said, but. Mostly, what is our large intestine responsible for? Absorbing water. Yep. And then elimination is obviously the part at the end. <laughs> so by our large intestine absorbing that water, it's creating stool. So it's drying it out so that we don't lose all of our water. So we'll go over the rest of this. So the, kind of the rest of the chapter talks about, and you'll probably remember some of this from cell biology if you took that. So just kind of how our bodies need and use these uh, nutrients that we've spent all of this time breaking down. Peristalsis. Yep. That's okay. Where's the, there's a picture here. There's peristalsis. So it's basically just showing the contracting and then relaxing, contracting, relaxing, and that's what moves it down. So that happens through your esophagus, through your small intestine, your large intestine. It's what just keeps food moving. Okay. Any other questions there so far? 
because that's pretty much what we're doing today, just the anatomy, physiology sort of bit. And we will review it again probably Thursday before our test. We can just go over it. And Mark Hale and Abigail will give us their presentation too, so that will also be a nice review. But really it'll just come down to, you know, going through the process. Like I said, that YouTube video is nice. After you've done the reading, um, it might be good to go back and watch that again. It might make more sense to you now that you know some of how that goes. So we have lots of time left. If you guys want to use this time to work on your food log, if you need to finish or work on your color sheet or your worksheet, you can do those. Um, what else do we have going on? I think that's all you have. Oh, finish your lab sheet that we did yesterday. If you have any questions on any of that stuff. So tomorrow, your three-day piece, we'll finish that in, so that nutrition lab we did yesterday, there's a small question there. So um, we'll do that. If your three days is done, if you did all three, then you can do, you can finish this if you want. There's one question right here. That's based on your three-day assessment. If your three days are done, then you can um, do that one question left on your lab, too. Uh, yeah, yeah, you could do that. Yeah, I think I did give you another one, didn't I? No, that's okay. You can just leave it there. The sheet was just to keep it... Just to keep track if you wanted. Do you want another one or you just want to leave it where it is? So your three day one, if you wanted to work on that, it was on the third, no wait, what page was it on? Yeah, on the third page, if your three-day nutrition log is done, it's whether you're following the 50% carb, 30% fat, 20% protein rule. So you can look at how many grams you had per day of carbohydrate, fat, and protein. So add them up from your list. And then figure out if it adds up to what your requirements are. Because you already figured out up here what like how many gram of carbs do you need per day so you already figured that out 250 yeah so you can look at your carbohydrates here add them up per day and see if you came close to to what you need yep the chicken would have protein did you get the protein part is it a whole chicken breast? Yeah, it's a chicken And it only said 7.1 grams? Yeah. It only said 7.1 grams? No, it should be closer to like 30. Oh, that's what it said on the side. Hmm. That's what I thought. I didn't know what to do. Let's see. Maybe you're just looking at the wrong number. Let's see what we can find. 